You just have to make the picture. You have the rest of your life to figure out what it means. Photography is an art of observation. It has little to do with the things you see and everything to do with the way you see them. Hey, welcome to the Street Shots Photography Podcast. This is Antonio. And this is Ward. And this is episode one. 72 for the end of November, and I hope everybody had a wonderful Thanksgiving, wherever you ate, whatever you did, whatever you watched. Whatever whatever football teams you're cheering for. Whatever teams you watch, yeah, whatever. Uh, But uh, here we are, and getting into December already. Oh, man. See, now's the time we can see the Christmas stuff. It's fine. It's fine to have all this Christmas crap up now. Do you have yeah. that issue in, in Canada we, where they start we putting do. up Christmas stuff up in uh, July? Yeah, well, or when <laughs> the, like the dollar stores start putting up the stuff, uh, the, the, um, uh, the, you know, around, even around Halloween, you're starting to see the Christmas that stuff. Just yeah, illegal. just, yeah, Can it's you not just good. just do something about that? Yeah. I don't know what the rush is. I don't, I don't understand. I never understand this. And this is, you know, one of those, is, you might as well try to touch the far side of the moon then try to figure out the uh, the logic behind putting up christmas stuff after after uh, i just trying Halloween. to get people to buy stuff i think buying buying yeah well well speaking of buying <laughs> no i yes i have not bought anything I, okay I, no no in fact i sent some stuff back and, okay. and got a refund yeah i have um i was telling you offline but i'll say i have this little adapter ring that's now stuck onto uh, my Metabones adapter for my GFX camera, and I'm a little. Uh, I'm hoping I can get that thing off. But it's and, not uh, stuck on the camera. It's stuck on. It's the not lens. stuck on the camera. Yeah. That's fine. It's that's better than. But the Metabones is something I use. And well, anyway, you know, first world problems, right? Right. Yeah. Hopefully, get it off. I had sent back. Um, I had a an adapter for GFX to. What was it? Um, Yashica contacts, and then I bought a Yashica contacts to M42 screw adapter, uh, and I was going to attach those to the to the meta bones, and then screw in my uh, Helios. um, What is it? Uh, M44 or 44M? 44, yeah. Yeah, and uh, that didn't work out because the adapter didn't stay on, and so I sent those two mm-hmm. things back. And then I realized, well, I've got this Metabones with a Nikon adapter, mm-hmm. and so I can just get an, you know a Nikon ring. And so I, I did send the two things back, which were more money, and the ring was twenty bucks. And so I got that. But now that <laughs> stupid thing is stuck. Man. Yeah, I know. It's like I said, it's first world problems, but uh, I'll figure out how to get it up. But yes, no, I haven't bought anything. I've sort of flattened out the the gear purchase for a while. I do have a computer that I have to set up, but I haven't gotten around to that. And so anyway, yeah. Cool. I haven't, I haven't sunk in much money at all into, uh, into gear at all. So I'm good. I bought a couple of uh, cable releases that I might, I'm going to go out and maybe do some winter landscape this winter and then that's when i bring my adapters out is at winter time i think maybe i'm the same oh. as you so yeah i've got these uh i've got m42 lenses um as well and my adapters that work with the fuji and i've got that really nice uh, micro nikor um 55 the 55 yeah yeah it's yeah. a great lens for just the do one. general purpose yeah yeah and i i have the 60 millimeter version of that which is I remember the fifty. I remember the fifty-five, and I sold it. I don't know why I sold so many nice pieces of Nikon equipment. I guess I needed the money at the time. Yeah, but anyway, uh, so I could have used. Oh, well, I could have used the macro lens. I actually, I hear there's some new macro lenses coming out. I'm sorry, we're, we're for everybody who's used to listening to us talk about stuff. We're, I usually don't talk about gear, but <laughs> I'm talking about gear. it's before Christmas. We're talking about buying things. So. Uh, or using old things, you know, or using old things. There's, there's a new, there's a new Fuji macro lens that is tempting. And there's also, I think it's going to be a GFX macro lens coming out, which 
is also tempting. I just don't have a need for those yet. Oh, I did buy a piece of gear. Sorry. <laughs> and I had to send it back. It was, uh, sorry, it was a, a T, it was a TT Artisans, um, like pancake 27 millimeter for a Fuji. Okay. Uh, and I got it and it was fun. I put it on and it looked great. And the problem was that it wouldn't go f- further open than F7.1. Oh, for some that's strange not reason, good. It, it would stop there. It can go, it would, you know, and it was only, it's only like a, it was like $140. So it's, you know, right. it's these, you know, this, you're, you're, yeah, I know. Yeah. Ornus Photos is, is, is selling these things, or at least not the TT artists, right? You're selling mm-hmm. seven artists. I sell but seven the, artists on too. I don't know why they have the same name or similar names. I think they're in adjacent buildings, actually. Oh, so they're just copying. They them, are, right? yeah. Owen is uh, maybe a little bit more higher end, but yeah, there you go. Well, anyway, this this lens I sent back and uh, asked for a new one, so hopefully that will come in soon. But uh, it, I like the idea of the pancake lens, so mm-hmm. the small little thing. Uh, and I remember the Fuji one was always hard to get. I uh, can't really get those. So, so yes, I did buy something, but <clears throat> I did send it back. <laughs> so, but, uh, but speaking about speaking about gear, sorry, we 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 wanted to talk tonight a little bit about what you, like old looking at our old pictures. Yeah, looking at our old work. Yeah, and those of us that started earlier in life and now we're later in life. Later, going in back life. and having a look at at our old. Well, for me, it's my negative file and my old slides and. Some do old have, prints. Do you have a lot of slides? Do you have a lot of slides? Yeah, I have a few, maybe 500, somewhere around there. Not too many. So, yeah, no, and there's the sirens. Yay! It just feels <laughs> like home. I just love it. I know. I thought I it hear the sirens. I was... I, I, I'm a big fan, actually. Now I know, I, like, I know what it's like to be there. I know what the air smells like. I know. Yeah. It it's... brings it all back to me, man. I know. I know. And then it, I just like, please, for one night, can I not have sirens go by? Please, for one <laughs> night. But anyway, uh, only 500. Sl- wow. That's not a lot. In no. Your, in it your isn't. span of time. Well, of ones that I kept, I mean, I did jettison quite a few. There are ones yeah, that still, I thought were. Yeah, you know, still. Yeah. All right. I got I mean, a few got... carousels here. Uh, not all of them are carousels. Full, can you? <laughs> People are like, what's a carousel? What's a carousel? Well, it's the thing what you put in the slide projector. It's that big round slide thing. Slide projector goes junk, junk. One time yeah. in school, um, we had a two. Uh, we had a bunch of projectors, but we also had a dissolve unit. Oh yeah, I remember two. those. I think I saw. That, one I can't at remember how it once. worked, but it was really cool. It was it it, you, it allowed you to connect two projectors, and you could dissolve between the two images. So you just yeah, wind up bring the two the, projectors. That's right. It would bring the, la- the, lamp, the lamp down lamp. on one. It would advance. And then by the time it lay- lamp came right. out again. So you had this cross. You could get a really nice cross dissolve. And actually one time in school, uh, it was actually for a film class. My, um, my friends and I made a film, quote unquote, by shooting like lots of film, lots of slides. Mm-hmm. And making step progressions in this story. And then we used the dissolve unit with music through a speaker system that we had. It was it was really one of those things like start the slideshow, press the button yeah. with the music, yeah. and then watch this story go by with the slides and the carousels. Um, and it's, it's like since then, I've always loved dissolves. I've always loved the... Uh, yeah, that's cool. But I, I don't have... I have very many, 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 many transparencies. And I have I've had a lot more... When my stock agency sent them all back, and I had, but I don't know if they sent them all back, I probably would have had close to a quarter million, maybe. Oh, yeah. yeah, I was never that. Keen. Well, it was just the nature of stock. When yeah. I would shoot stock, I would shoot. I got a really nice scene. I would shoot maybe twenty or thirty versions, or you know, similars we called them of mm-hmm. the same shot. You know, if I could do that, especially if I was doing still life, and so I ended up this way. They could submit the. Uh, an original of each of those of that scene to each of the different franchise offices. There was actually when I was at the image bank, there were about, I think they got to the top 60 offices around the world. Wow. Cool. Yeah. And so, uh, you know, if, if there was not a scene that was moving, right. Like, Cause you can only shoot so many, Yeah. but you know, if there was a static scene, like, you know, the world trade center, I photographed a lot through my windows and I was like, and everybody mm-hmm. loved pictures of the world trade center. And so, you know, I would shoot, you know, especially in sunset because I faced, I faced 
uh, west when I was shooting them. Uh, you know, it would take 20 or 30, right? You know, yeah. so I'd go through a roll of film, put it in and develop it, and then I'd submit those all, label them, and then they would, you know, the editors, which I was also an editor. I wasn't allowed to edit my own work, obviously. Right. <laughs> it was not a, not a you know, it was, a, it was hard enough for me working there and being a submitting photographer uh, than me to also edit my work, and we never allowed that. And so the editor would go through and loop each picture and then, you know, sends, you know, the 20 copies to maybe like the 20 top offices if they decided to keep the pictures. If there was one picture that they liked that they wanted to keep in the archives, we did what was called duping. Okay. Yeah. A duping system. And they would put it into a box and then we would send that off to a lab and they would make duplicates using a very low contrast slide duplication film with a slide duplicator. Right. And uh, and then then those copies would also then go to the offices as well, and they sort of represented the best pictures that you know Image Bank uh, had, or at least what was considered the best by the uh, by the editors. Hmm. So anyway, when they went out of business, all those originals came back to me right. in boxes, and then they came back all mixed up because all the boxes they you know they weren't they were just getting the pictures back to me, not the same. Right. You know, they had no obligation to sort them. <laughs> so I've got all these boxes of stuff that I'm. You can see them. Where are they? Uh, right there. Well, you were you were sleeping in this room, so yeah, yeah. You saw all the boxes. Yeah, I did. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and every now and then, I go through them. I have more time now to go through them, and then f s sort of sort the ones that I want to keep. Yeah. Uh, and then I have to destroy the other ones, like physically yeah. destroy them. Um, yeah. Because there are stories of people going through trash and uh, and. Deciding to, you know, if I had a nice clean slide in the trash and someone found it, they could, you know, they could use yeah, it. Yeah, they could use it. Yeah. Actually, there was a story about Jay Maisel, a story. I, I knew this, actually, in his uh, bank building, which you never got a chance to walk by. No. Well, next, next time. time. Next time. Jay Maisel used to shoot also tons and tons of transparencies. And what he ended up doing was taking all the rejects, stuffing them in garbage bags, and then he, like, used them almost like insulation, like stuffed them in the walls and stuff. And he also one time made uh, a, um, a curtain of them. I the best way to describe it. Like uh, he, someone had, like attached all the slides together, like a bunch of them, and made a giant sort of window covering. Okay. So that it was like a uh, it was like a um, stained glass. Okay, cool. Right? And because the you know they attached all the cardboard mounts together and then created this thing, and a friend of mine who worked at Image Bank, uh, she modeled for Jay and did a nude pose in front of that. So it was all this colored light from oh, the slides, cool. and it made a really nice abstract picture. I just remember that now. But um, but sorry, I, I'm, I'm sort of No, that's cool. So pictures. No, no. That, well, I, well, while we're still on, on you here, I'm going to ask you a question you're not expecting, like the last show. Um. So you go through these old things, and what do you what are you thinking? What are you feeling? Like uh, are you seeing? I think what interests me about this is not maybe there's a nostalgia component. Maybe there isn't. Maybe you find that you're you're far more creative, or you're you know a better better photographer, whatever you want to call it, than you were then. Um, do you see um, elements in that old work that you see carrying on to your present work? Well, what what goes through your head when you're going through all those old pictures? Well, that's a good question, and it's really long-winded one too. Which <laughs> I know, but... I'm really good at. <laughs> well, you have a new mic; you got to use it. <laughs> okay, if you're fine with it, I'm fine with it. Um, I was just doing this last night, which was uh, before I was going to sleep, and I ended up not going to sleep because I pulled out a box of of chromes, and uh, we called them chromes, by the way. Yeah. I read that in a magazine. I would the, always call them in a, sl a slide, but they say, uh, call yeah, them chromes. get, get yeah. those chromes from the central office. Yeah. Whatever. It's funny how I just naturally just rolled off my tongue, actually, because I haven't said that word in a while. So it was uh, in the mindset of, of looking through my old chromes. Uh, well, it's funny because I do find that there are some, uh, some of like hints of where I'm at now in my old pictures. In fact, mm -hmm. Some of the shots that I was going through last night, I just I pulled out a random box, and uh, it was a mixture of stuff that had come back from the stock agency and stuff that was already that I already had here, and I just mm -hmm. sort of consolidated them. 
there were shots that I did in uh, at least that I had dated on the slide 1986. So that would have been my last year in college. And right. uh, uh, it was, and I was already working in imagery, but there was some like street photography that I did. Uh, and I'll post those up in the show notes since I, 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 I digitized them. We'll talk about that in a little bit. And just like someone walking down the street, sort of a blurry legs against mm-hmm. a, against a, um, a blue construction wall. And then another guy, another picture of a guy standing, this giant garage that says no standing. So, of course, right. I was looking for the – and it was actually one of my favorite pictures back then. Mm-hmm. And I could see the – you know, this is the kind of stuff I'm doing now, um, you know, more – more often than not, and I wasn't doing a lot of street photography back in college days or when I was first shooting chromes. Um, so there is some of that. And there's, because most of the photography that I was doing, they were sort of geared towards stock. And so mm-hmm. I had a certain kind of, I was going for a certain kind of look, certain kind of framing. Right. Uh, whatever. It, it It's a... I don't want to say it's commercial looking. It's not the right word because I think a commercial looking very magazine is, but it was very, hmm, I don't know how to say this. Stocky. Well, stocky, but it, what does stocky mean? It's just. Um, Has a kind of a genericness to it. It does have a genericness. But, but there were some pictures that from my travels, uh, stuff that I shot in London. Actually, I, want, I found out, I found one of the pictures, one of the first pictures uh, I shot when I first bought a 20 millimeter lens. Okay. It was a Nikon 20 millimeter lens. I, it might have been used when I bought it, maybe, but it was a photograph that I did on Park Avenue. And again, this sort of like, wow, look how wide this lens is. <laughs> and so I was shooting the ground and, and up into the, into the cityscape a little bit at the, what was then called the Pan Am building. Mm. Um, and because it's even captioned the Pan Am building, which is now the Met Life building. Yeah. Uh, and when I was looking at that picture, that's what I couldn't, I, I forgot all about that image. And then I remembered I, it wasn't, well, maybe it was kind of stocky, maybe not because it was very wide angle. Mm-hmm. There wasn't a lot of wide angle cityscapes being used, I think, for stock. Eh. So I don't know. Uh, but it made me remember that that was like one of the first pictures I took with that lens mm-hmm. when I first got a wide angle lens. And it was like, you know. My, the widest lens I had at that point was a 28 millimeter. And so having this 20 millimeter where I can see, your, you know, you could see the horizon and you could see your toes. Right. <laughs> yeah. um, but what was really kicking in for me was more of the, wow, this is like, it didn't feel like the kind of photography that I do. Right. I don't mm-hmm. know if that's the right question. I was like, I was a little surprised. I was right. a, little, a little surprised at some of the pictures, not all of them. Like I'm, because I can. It's really funny. It's like I can remember most of them. Oh, like, like I'm. I like, do that oh, just I'm, looking at negatives. Like I don't need to look at the prints. I can look at the negatives and. Oh really? Oh um, yeah. 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 I I I just remember like oh I remember when I shot this, uh, I remember this, I remember that. There was a few that were like uh, mm, <laughs> I don't have memory on, but some of the earlier early ones. It, it was funny was that some of the early shots that I did, I was also doing oh man this is so bad i can't believe i say this <laughs> we'll no, get to me just, shortly i know it's just it because my my last year in college overlapped with me working at the image bank and i was when i was working there actually i i got signed to the image bank in 1986 i was the youngest photographer to get signed at the time and uh i was still in school when they signed me because there was uh, people were looking at my pictures and saying, why don't we just sign this guy? He's doing photography that is the kind of stuff we do here. Right. But my working at the image bank was influencing my photography. And when I did my thesis, whatever that was, yeah. when it was a photography thesis, it was very commercial oriented, which was really mm. weird because School of Visual Arts was not a very commercial school. Right. In fact, I got very little commercial photography um, learning in SVA. It was more oriented towards art. So, art, it was, yeah. but I also had a, I had a, uh, an instructor in my last year, my thesis year, who was like, it was his first year teaching. So it was kind of like, eh, you know, maybe, maybe he was, and he was also a commercial photographer. So maybe I got into his, his good side by doing that. Mm-hmm. Anyway, some of the pictures I'm describing to you, 
I didn't I didn't only submit as stock, but I also used as my final portfolio at SVA. Okay. So the picture with the um, uh, the person walking in blurry against the uh, the back the blue background and the guy standing in front of the garage those were two that I had in my front of portfolio. So that was interesting, and then I ended up submitting them <laughs> to right. the to the image bank. It was like, well, I don't want them on my portfolio. I just you know put them out there to make money. Yeah. So those pictures were so different than when I started getting into a sort of a stock oriented mind. Right set, you know, and, and, and shooting that. But, you know, there's some surprise at looking at the old stuff and saying, look at where I am now and look mm -hmm. at where I started. And it almost seems like a different person, but, but then, you know, realizing the context, everything was, it was, was context, context related. And I was doing things because I wanted to make money in photography and, and that's how I could do it. And I oriented my pictures that way. And I was pretty successful as a mm -hmm. stock photographer. And, and the photography was not, I don't, you know, it wasn't, when you say stocky, yeah, but it wasn't, uh, it was good photography. I knew yeah. how to do pictures. I knew how to uh, frame, um, you know, technically they were really good. You know, I you mm -hmm. know, would not make out of focus pictures. And, and so sort of run up to what I was doing last night, I was pulling these out, looking at them and I decided to, um, sort of start, quote unquote, scanning them. We talked about digitizing or scanning or duplicating or whatever. Mm -hmm. And I used to have a Nikon uh, cool skin, which was a single, which lets you do single s slides. Or if you had a, a negative strip, you can do strips of negatives. And then that was, <laughs> you would attach that with Firewire. And, right. and <laughs> sorry. Firewire 400 or Firewire 800? Uh, it was a Firewire 400, so okay. it wasn't fast. In fact, I had to get an adapter for a Firewire, Firewire 400 to Firewire 800 to do scanning on my, my Mac Pro, my older Mac Pro. The thing would take forever to scan right. a slide. It would scan it at 4,000 DPI, whatever really mm -hmm. that meant. And it was probably the best way to make a... Uh, scan on a sl uh, slide or any kind of scanner like that. There was Minolta scanners, I think, mm. and uh, Nikon cool scans. I don't know who else made scanners. I think Agfa might have made slide scanners. And you would s stick the slide in there and you'd bring up the software and you'd scan it and then you'd go have a coffee. By the time <laughs> you come back, you're, you know, especially if you did it at the highest resolution, you'd come back. And uh, anyway, I, I, probably could have set this up to work on my iMac and there was probably some connectors and software it could have gotten to work on it but it's been sitting on my shelf for a while it was sitting on my shelf and i recently brought it to a donation center to get rid of it mm -hmm. because now i'm doing um now i'm doing my digitizing using this sort of frankensteiny monster setup Correct. on <laughs> well uh, I had bought this thing, and what is it? What am I? What is this thing called? The Nikon. Sorry, we're getting gear here. Or anything. Where am I stuck? I'm sorry, got to do this. Nikon film digitizing adapter, the ES2, which is this little screw-on, uh, 52 millimeter screw-on slide or negative um, duplicator. It looks like a little lens with a. How would you call this thing? In the front. Well, uh, the slider, like a slide or whatever. Holder, slide yeah. holder. And there's a carrier. Frosted, Let's call it a carrier. A carrier. Thank you. Slide carrier. And then in front of that is a frosted piece of plexiglass to diffuse light. And the idea is that you're supposed to attach this to a Nikon. I think it's designed for a Nikon D850. And you were supposed to attach it to a, a 60 millimeter macro the lens. 60 millimeter macro. Yeah, it's a right. nice flat field lens. A flat field lens, which let you get all the corners in focus. And then you put a slide in there and then you take a picture or a negative. I think you can also, this comes with a negative carry. You take a picture of it by pointing this uh, thing at any kind of light source, making sure your white balance is fine. And then you take a shot and you've got Nikon D850 is about a 45 megapixel camera. Mm -hmm. So you've got then a 45 megapixel duplicate of your slide. Right. Or your negative, and I bought it, thinking that I would connect it to my Nikon D seven thousand. When I realized it was not meant for, for uh, smaller sensor cameras. Oh, I see. So I was like, "Oh, doke. And so when I when I, I attached this to my Fuji, and I used the adapter and the lens, it just didn't work. It was too. Um, it zoomed in too much to the slide, and I was like, right. "Damn it!" And so I ended up adding this little extension ring, 
which is a Nikon PK12. So an extension ring goes between uh, what I've got on this thing is I'm showing it to you in the camera, but I've got a, a Nikon to Fuji adapter, right? So that goes onto the camera. Mm-hmm. So it allows me to attach Nikon lenses to it. Right. Then I've got this extension ring, this PK12, mm-hmm. which ex- which m- will make a lens focus a little closer. Right. And then instead of a 55 or 60 millimeter macro, and I realized I had a Nikon 28 millimeter. Now it's not a flat field macro lens, but once you put a once you put this um, adapter ring on, then you can do close focusing. Right. And because the the 28 millimeter is also a 55 millimeter, uh, or what is is it 55 millimeter uh, f- uh, filter length, I could put this uh, Nikon slide duplicator oh, on the front of that. Oh, cool. And so by doing that, all of, all these little steps, doing that, I can now record a slide onto an APS-C sensor. And wow. it, it gives me a little bit of a border, so I don't get a full on, on this... Um, on the X so you can crop a little bit. You've got the luxury of being able to, to well, but that's better than being too close, right? Being too right. That's better in. than being too close. And the, the other thing I used to do with my Nikon uh, slide duplicate uh, Nikon scanner was I would take the film out and I would put it into what was called a full frame mount. There were right right now the if you look at a thirty five millimeter slide or chrome, it's in a cardboard mount that actually crops into the picture with the cardboard. And so there were mm-hmm. these plastic full frame mounts that with little pin registers in there and you can stick the oh, piece yeah. of film in there yeah, yeah. and then it would show the entire frame. I don't know if that would fit into this because um, they're, they're kind of fat mounts, but, um, but it would let you get the whole image which is what you saw when you're photographing, but the right. mounts always cropping out. So anyway, it's a long way of saying I've been dropping slides into this thing and taking pictures of them. I got a little lamp set up for, I got a little, uh, right. And you don't have to worry about white balance. You're just letting the camera set white balance or you, uh, no, I set the white balance for the same that I said, I bought these little led lights from aperture. Mm, Yeah. So I set this up to, I set the light up to 5,000 K and then I set the camera to 5,000 K and bingo. We're right on. And with the new cameras, the new, um, XH2, they have a film, simulation called Eterna. Right. Which is for their cinema. Right. Um, uh, I hear cinema. raves about that. Uh, I hear raves about that, um, um, that, that simulation. Yeah. It's a, it's a nice simulator, but it, what's nice about it is that it will, um, it will let you go, uh, very flat, flat mm-hmm. colors. And so that allows me to then, uh, duplicate the slide uh, and try to keep the original colors, which I can bring back, or I can, you know, boost in in, um, you know, in Lightroom or yeah, something like that. Yeah, pretty so, cool. Yeah, but that's that's the technical part. And now for the aesthetic part is is for me going back and pulling these, well, not the aesthetic part, but the sort of memory part looking at these and realizing I can turn them into digital files. And I, I did about a dozen, two dozen of them last night. I just sort of popped them in and click, 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 and, mm-hmm. and then uh, stuck a card in and uh, put them into Lightroom, and I've been playing with them. And I'm actually been doing the Lightroom on my phone, so I'm bringing the pictures into Lightroom, actually on my iPad, and then retouching them by just tapping and getting rid of the dust because there's dust on them. And it's like ten thousand times better than using a film scanner. Oh yeah, so cool. it it it's it's a letting me, uh, you know, I don't know if I'll put these pictures up or do anything with them, or I'm not gonna sell them as stock. Some of the personal pictures I've been a little bit more interested in because there's a lot of stuff from my history and you know, uh, finding finding pictures of my late wife um, popping up, you know, stuff mm-hmm. that I shot uh, with my little Olympus XA. As mm-hmm. I'm remembering. Uh, and so those things I'm scanning or scanning, digitizing and putting them up on a memorial page for now. And, um, so I'll probably be doing more of those. Those are kind of fun to find. Uh, yeah. so cool. anyway, it's, it, it's for me, uh, you know, I can see this being my winter project going through the slides, digitizing yeah. a few of them and then, and then, you know, at least having an archive of them, having another kind of archive. So. No, that's great. Anyway, that was a long-winded way of me getting to, to, I don't know what the, I don't know if you even answered your question. 
Yeah, you did. Uh, you well, I, 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 part of it. I don't think we got very much into the the feelings around, um, you know, how you feel about looking at your old work. I guess you, I guess you did answer that. Um, well, the, I, I'm, I'm happy to look at my old work. I like seeing where where I've come from and what I was doing, and yeah. uh, and I'm happy also because I like the pictures. I still like a lot of the pictures. I mean, mm. they may be. You know, um, cliche, some of them, but, uh, I know that I did them and I know they helped me get to this point where I'm at now. And, and so I'm, I'm look I look at them with favorable happiness or, uh, and some excitement because sometimes I, I, like I said, I don't, I find a picture that I didn't realize I took, or I don't remember exactly, right. or it's some part of my history. And, and that at this point in my life, you know, we're, oh, <laughs> yeah. As an older person, it's I'm I'm kind of excited to sort of relive those pictures, especially pictures of, of uh, Elizabeth. I was finding some shots I took of her in the Carnegie Deli. Oh, uh, cool. when I didn't even realize I had those pictures. And like, how did I know it was the Carnegie Deli? It's like I had to look at the background. It's like, oh, oh yeah, yeah. It's the Carne- because we used to go there and get pastrami sandwiches. Dead well, reckoning. Corn- yeah, yeah, yeah. She got corned beef, and I got pastrami and stuff. Right. And we would swap. <laughs> so, but yeah, I. I and I'm sure some of them, it, it's just bringing back a lot of memories. And, yeah. and I haven't, I haven't sorted through all that yet. Cause I'm just starting to, you know, you know, we're hunkering down for winter now. And I thought, well, you know, maybe I can do that on top of other things I want to do. So cool. Uh, what about for you? I mean, you're, you, you talked about this subject several times about going through your archive, yeah. reflecting on your pictures and yeah. going back. So what is it, what is it like for you to go back? Um, there's some nostalgia, for sure. And I go through negatives. Like I can, you know, years of being in the dark room. I don't have much of my high school days, any of those negatives. They're around somewhere, but I just, I didn't really, uh, keep a very good file system for those. Like, um, compared to when I started up again later in the eighties. And then I have all that stuff right here with my books. Um, so that part of my memory or, Looking back, a picture starts when my I started my darkroom up in 1988, and the first roll of film I think I was when T Max this when T Max 400 was coming out or just came out or was in wide use anyway. Um, the very first frame that I shot with that was a printable frame of the sidewalk with an embossed um, um, kind of the brand of the city and the company that, that poured the concrete in 1915 or whenever it was. And the, the texture of the, of the sidewalk and the grass around the border. And it was all, all the pictures that I took from that first roll look like, um, uh, film tests. <laughs> We're going to take a picture of, yeah, and it's and it it's pretty wide ranging too. There's there was a stainless steel sculpture on the university campus where I used to work, and so I get a picture of that. So there'd be the stainless steel with all this con- contrast and and um, you know a, a dedication to a lost friend that was written in on a river stone that was like embedded in at the base of the stat of that of that sculpture, and taking pictures of the trunk of a tree was lit by dappled sunlight and like all of the, all these little test things. And I, I was, I tried to you know hit what the, you were gr- trying to, what, what you were trying to test. Cause you said this was the, I was going mass. from, I was going from tri X. All I knew was plus X and tri X was the only black and white films I ever shot before. And now I was going to try, I bought a hundred foot, you know, sight unseen. I bought a hundred foot roll of, of um, a T Max 400, and that was going to be for that next, you know, that summer and that fall, I was going to be shooting that T Max 400. So I wanted to understand it, and and, and I had I had the uh, the Ilford multigrade paper, so I had the the set with me so I could adjust the contrast or whatever. And wh- I think what I was trying to do is I was trying to short circuit the amount of time it took me to get acceptable printable Mm. images by doing a test right off the bat. So I got off to a good thing. Sorry. But what's the, what was the major difference between tri X and T max? Very much denser that it's a much denser film than tri X was a tri X. 
I was always afraid, and even with TMAX 400. And what do you mean denser, too? What is well, it's if you underexpose, I found, at least the way I metered and the way I shot and with my gear, I was always terrible at underexposing triax, and there's so, it would be clear. <laughs> the negatives would be <laughs> just way too thin, and I would you try and bring up shadows, and I would just get textureless gray. There would be nothing there. So TMAX 400 is really good at that, but it was a denser that the grain structure was different. It was, they called it, uh, they called it a tabular format. It was a different shape of crystal. Hmm. So because it was a tabular format, the idea is that, that there's the crystals take up whatever X amount of area or volume, but the tabular format means there's a little bit more surface area facing towards the light source. And so you would get a more positive, denser, um, denser result. If I didn't you use this, actually, yeah. yeah, if you use this, um, what was the other? Was it Ilford? I think made a tabular, made a tabular um, film too. I can't remember. Anyway, um, and so I really liked that. I really liked that I could shoot at four hundred. Where when I was shooting triax, I often shot at three twenty or even two fifty, depending on what the situation was. So I, I like that, and I got I I it took me a while to get into the tones of T Max because, um, because it was it was uh, it was responding to exposure in a much better way. Um, when I got to some of the denser parts of the image, um, then you could kind of see uh, denser parts of the negative, which means the lighter parts of the image. Um, there would be. Uh, there would be like a texture or a grain that you would see in in the lighter parts of the of the uh, of the picture when you printed it. And so there was you got, you got this from the first roll of film that you. Tested? No, 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 just oh. uh, no. That would, well, I I got a sense of it as I went yeah. on. Right. So I was thinking always about the darkroom stuff, and unlike you, who was the pro, who was taught. And you were surrounded by this community of editors and photographers to get your chops up to shoot like aesthetic things and things that would sell, which I did sell. I sold, I was more of a service guy than I was, uh, you know, selling fine art. I don't, I don't think I ever sold a fine art print when I was in, in the eighties there. I gave away a lot of my fine art pictures, but, um, doing those tests and there was an aesthetic component to them too. I tried to make them look as nice as I could. I still got them. They're in my little tear sheet in my little book, uh, my little book upstairs. Um, but I was not thinking about the subject at all. Even when I was going and shooting, I guess you could call it street photography. It was more like gawking or whatever. I would shoot, you know, the buildings. It's funny. There's a building, uh, uh Bow Valley square that I shot, on the street corner. It was probably within that first summer, that's first spring or summer. I stood in the middle of the street and in the middle of the intersection, actually on a Saturday and shot up and got the reflection of the glass of Bow Valley square that was up over my head. So it got this crossfire thing and you could see the, um, the lights that were on inside the building that the reflection was bouncing off. And it kind of gave you this, uh, uh, you know, this kind of three-dimensional effect of, oh, I can see inside the building at the same time I'm getting the reflection mm, mm. of the buildings that are behind me and that sort of thing. So I was doing these things, not really, not really paying attention to what I was doing, just kind of trying to find some interesting things. But as that summer kind of wore on and I was walking around the, um, you know, places that became very familiar to me later in life and when I worked downtown for 20 years, um, it's interesting um, to to see pictures of those places, how the buildings are used differently, and businesses have come and gone, and so on. And a favorite uh, deli restaurant that we used to go to that's long gone. And um, and but that picture that I took of the the reflection in Bow Valley mm-hmm. Square that was a building I ended up working in for quite a few years. <laughs> funny, huh? Yeah. So I said, eh, if I had told my younger self when I was standing in the middle of this intersection on that Saturday that I'd be working in that building and getting to know all the people around there and, and all that kind of stuff. So there's that kind of uh, time travel thing that we talk about every now and then that yeah. I find kind of find enjoyable. You're getting this from looking at your negatives though, right? You yes. Don't and well, I've got a few prints. I've got a few yeah. prints from that first roll. But you have less prints than you have negatives. That's right. Because you only yeah. print a few. So what about all these negatives that you have that you might like to go back to? 
what would be right now your process? Because do you have a dark room at home? No, I don't have a dark room. But if so I really, what would, what, what would what would you do? Well, if I w was really excited about a particular negative, I'd do something quick and dirty, like take a picture of it with the um, uh, with the iPhone. Take a picture of a frame with the iPhone in reverse. You know, just do or or use the uh, the contrast app that contrast by Hornbeck, and put it in reverse mode and take a picture of it. If I really wanted to look at a print of it, uh, you know, something that looked more like a print. Um, and there's, I mean, there's really nothing stopping me from, from scanning them either, but, or just going to, scanner? uh, we have a, yeah, I do have a, we've got an old Canon scanner 4,400 and it does have a negative thing. So if I was really okay. excited about that, we could, and so I have at least done, you get, a, you get a, could get a decent file from it. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. All right. I wasn't sure about like how you were going to go about that because you have all these negatives and unless you have a scanner or some way to do it, then you got to go, you know, or if you want to actually go back to your darkroom, it's a big production yeah. for negatives. Even if no, I have no intention of doing that. And if I, you know, at the technical college here, you know, if I took a printing course, there's an advanced printing course that, um, the, uh, um, our photographer emeritus around Calgary, George Weber is a friend of, uh, well, he's now a friend of mine, but he taught Mark Ryerson and the, yeah, I think there's an intermediate printing course. Hmm. If I could use that dark room, if I really wanted to, to make prints, but no, my, I get the nostalgia just from looking at the negatives. I don't need, you know, I would look at the, and I would keep notes with each roll. So I knew the subject. And wow. so I would go, I would go through, um, I would go through the, uh, you know, what time and date and what my notes were for timing and concentration of the developer and all that kind of stuff. And then, <laughs> the note. Jeez, so you were methodical that way. Huh. Well, I tr tried because I was really trying to get yeah. into a process, like try to be consistent because the thing when I was a kid was there just wasn't any consistency. And it was really frustrating because I didn't control water temperature well. I, you know, I was in a basement. Uh, chemical chemistry was always too cold. I had a small <laughs> kitchen sink that I actually had covered with a uh, tabletop surface that I was using to put the trays on. So actually the rinse was actually across the basement in another bathroom. So I would, I would hold individual prints or a tray. Sometimes I had a separate tray if I was at mm -hmm. several, several prints sitting in the fix. And then I would take three or four of them out and then walk it around to the, to the basement suite on the other side of the house and wow. put it in the, in the yeah. rinse there. So I had, it was kind of involved and there was just all these things were taking me away from consistency. Mm -hmm. Uh, so when I set up an 88, I definitely wanted to make sure that I knew what I was doing so that I didn't have to think because I, I really wanted to get, for me, it was really, I really wanted to get to what do I have to do here, here, and here? How far up does the enlarging head have to be up? You know, and I would lock it down or whatever. If I need to crop, okay, I need to crop. Oh. Then I've got to adjust oh. exposure and do all that kind of stuff. So that's all to say. You, oh, go ahead. No, I said that's all to say that I was doing all that, but what I was lacking was the aesthetic and the thinking, the visual thinking photographer part of me was left undeveloped pretty much through most of that period. I did have pictures that were good, and I think there were a few that were really good, but I go through those negatives. So I say, you know, I, I would look in my notes. And I'd say, oh, oh, here's a venue where I shot, you know, this downtown neighborhood where they used to be rickshaws that would pull people, cut young couples around. And it was mm -hmm. this kind of nice, you know, bohemian vibe going on mm -hmm. down there in those days. And then I look at the pictures and you go, oh, yeah, I, I remember this. These are terrible. <laughs> <laughs> I just looking at the negative. I mean, I just, and I got the clear glassine um, pages, right? So yeah. I just had to hold up the page and go through and wow, you know, there's just not a lot here, but there, there is the, you get a feel of what it was like back then. And so the, it's still, I can read negatives well enough that I could see, first of all, how difficult it might be to print, which all those night pictures w sort of were. Um, but yeah, the, it, it, the, a, a great majority of those pictures, those, those first hundred rolls or whatever, really not, not 
not that great. It's funny because you got to keep all your negatives, right? Because you you shoot thirty six exposures. After you develop them, you you slice them up into what six sixes strips yeah. of sixes, and, and you put them in there. And then if you got one in the middle, that's good. And you got four on one side and one on the other side that are not good. They have to sort of stay there in support of the one good negative. And I mean this physically, right? Yeah. Yeah. It wouldn't be like if you if you had five negatives, uh, five shots on that strip that mm-hmm. were bad that you would slice them up and, and destroy them and just keep the one yeah. frame. You couldn't do that practically. It wouldn't really work. No. And I'm I'm fine. I mean, they don't take up that much room, really. No, it's it's interesting because for me with slides, anything that was bad, I would destroy like, you know, when I'm going through them when I got them back from processing. Yeah. I'd go through them. I go with my loop and I'd loop them. And I go, oh, out of focus, out of focus, throw them, throw them out, you know, pinhole, throw that out, throw that out. Uh, you know, you know, someone stuck into the frame, throw that out, throw that out. Like yeah. the, the slides, because they're they're in packaged individually. Yeah. Right. You can deal with them on a one on one basis. So like if I go through all my when I whenever I finish going through this, if I ever end up finishing going through my pictures, I, I'll end up with, you know, the selects, a small amount, probably one or two percent of what's here will right. be what I keep. Uh, and then all the stuff that I don't want, I'll have I'll destroy again. I'll, you know, find, you know, oh I've got, you know, so many duplicates of this picture. I don't need I don't need fourteen copies of it. Right. So I keep one and throw out thirteen. But it's funny with the negatives. I just realized you got to keep everything so you can see. That's really interesting because you are. You then see the seeing, timeline as I'm walking right, down the street. Right, right, yeah. And then even if you do a contact sheet, you'll see all your progress. And and that's funny because with slides you don't do it. Although what's funny, but back with digital. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Sorry, I'm laughing about this, but with digital, I don't edit my stuff. Uh, not as much. Like if I shut, if I shoot X amount of pictures in a day. I might edit a few from the camera, like I'm sitting around saying, yeah, that one's bad, and I'll delete from the camera, which I tell people not to do. My students, I tell them not to do it because yeah, I think you never students, know. Yeah, students are, you know, it's like, do as I say, not as I do, kind of thing. Yeah. yeah. But, but I go through them like, yeah, I'll delete this, this one. But I'll download them all on my computer, and I w- literally will not go through each one, bring them up at, you know, 100% or whatever that fits the screen. And say, unless it's very obvious, I, I won't delete them because I'm not, I don't have enough time for that. Because, you know, yeah. you shoot, I shoot more digital than I ever shot film. So it's funny is that I will have, it's, I have more progression, as you say, or like seeing the, the, the sort of not so good stuff in my digital files than I had with slides. And it's just because of the, I don't know, laziness or something like that. I mean, it, yeah. you know, I shoot so many pictures that I just, I, I'm not getting paid to go through and delete it. And storage on computers, you know, yeah. is, is it doesn't cost anything. Well, it doesn't cost anything. It's like, you know, not that I get to, I get to take a storage space and store, you know, 250,000 slides. This stuff fits on a, you know, a hard drive that fits on my hand. Yeah. So anyway, it's just, I thought that was really interesting. Um, well, so I, too, well, for me, I've, I, with digital, I have layers. I have the Lightroom library unedited. Well, there's pictures edited, but that's the witch's brew of of stuff that you try and pull out, you know, the good images. And then the ones that you do edit that are good enough, you I put into an export directory, and then they sit in there for a while, not too long. And then of those, there's a layer where I post those to social media or make fine prints of or whatever. I, I really like digital that way. And that's why I, you know, I'm not that keen to go back to the dark room because one effort and two, there's different ways to, to contemplate, or it's probably the wrong word, but think of your images as, as on mass of, you know, the whole, the whole body of your work, good and bad. The ones you thought they were good are the ones that you feel confident enough to post. And then the ones that you make fine art prints with so Um, yeah it's interesting for me is looking at the in my progression from film to digital like we had film 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 right and then yeah uh when digital started to creep in the cameras were not good enough so i was still doing film but then scanning so it was yeah film was the original thing and until i got uh, i can actually tell you when the camera that i was serious enough to use 
for stock because we had certain requirements. They had a certain file size requirements was my Nikon D2X. Right. Um, which was a 12 megapixel camera. Right. And I think I got that in 2000, 2003, 2004. Uh, so for the 2004 around. Olympics, I think they were shooting with D2X. Yeah, 2004. And that was like, oh, okay. But before that, there's this sort of like, I don't know. I'm still using film for the purposes of shooting. For, I mean, I had digital cameras. I had a Nikon D100 and whatever came before after that. Because, but those were like six megapixel cameras, and so they weren't good enough for. And the upsampling technology wasn't really good enough yeah. to give to the image bank as a as a full size file. So it was good to play with, and I I got a lot of shots from that, which are sitting in um, now they're sitting in Lightroom. A lot of them. Uh, from those earlier cameras, but for my purposes of work, I still had to shoot film. So I had this sort of right. living two worlds. I had mm. and my, still my film cameras, and then I still had my digital cameras. And then I think after the D2X, I was still shooting some film, but like I started more, you know, 12 megapixels was actually good enough that like it gave you a 36 megabyte file, something like that. Uh, 12, 12, 12, yeah, 36 megabyte file. And then the upsampling was only, I needed to only go to 50 megs. So that right. wasn't that hard to upsample. So I could start submitting pictures. But anyway, my, my, my thinking about this is, is that uh, I was scanning pictures for a long time and, and, and also treating photography a lot differently with film because film is expensive and, you know, uh, there was maybe a lot less experimentation when you get digital. Mm -hmm. You can start, you know, storage, like I said, or the pictures don't cost anything. So you can go around and do whatever you want yeah. uh, and however you want to do it. And so there's this, there's a, it's weird little, I don't want to say the dark ages, but like a gray ages. Right. Yeah. <laughs> In between film scanning and when digital got uh, serious for me. But what I'm also thinking about now is as I'm, as I'm, I'm going to call it scanning just for lack of a better phrase, but as I'm scanning my old chromes again, I'm putting those into my Lightroom library and they're showing up as my newest pictures because they're essentially digital files shot with this camera mm -hmm. that they like how different stuff looks like how putting a picture that I shot recently out my window with my GFX or whatever and comparing them to, and I'm not talking about technical because this, you know, film and digital, are, you know, yeah. almost, different be night and day yeah but just the look of the two like where have i come from mm. uh and and how the how different this stuff looks and and you were talking about before like how things have changed i mean that's the one obvious thing like you know yeah. skylines have changed the met life building is used to be the pan am building and whatever but how my eye is has shifted and how it how it's shifted and how it hasn't shifted right there's there's two bits that that I can see that, oh, I, if I was shooting this subject that I shot in film today, would I approach it the same way? Probably, you know? Yeah. You know, if I'm looking at, you know, a skyline of Seattle or something like that, yeah. uh, would I have shot it with that same? I might have, back then with film, I would have used, a, you know, a magenta filter to give the sunset sky a little bit of, you know, nice and, and yeah. all the fluorescent lights will come out nice and stuff like that. And today I would change the white balance on yeah. this thing, you know? so yeah. I, w I would approach this it's funny how i would approach this some of the subjects the same way i don't know if you found that in, no, in, well because it didn't really shoot that much color so there wasn't a lot of um or print and color i never did get into color chemistry at all just sort of a shame i would have liked to have but gone I mean, into the discipline white, of it what's that even when you're black and white though if you look at the subjects would you have approached it the same in, in a similar way now, you know? I'm um, you well, part of it, because I didn't have a developed eye, really. One thing aesthetically that I noticed that I have developed is a comfort with there being a lot of darkness in the frame, like shooting at night. I did a lot of shooting at night, and I really like... Uh, it's not necessarily even a high-contrast subject. There's just a lot of darkness, a lot of black, kind of like a giant vignette over the whole thing that looks natural. It doesn't look like it's you know, burned down. Um, like one of my favorite pictures from, from those days. And that would have been the, with the summer of 88, July 9th, 19, I remember actually standing at this neon sign at this, um, hair salon 
and it was this pink Reno's unisex salon. And I got this kind of angled picture of it, of the neon. It was in a storefront. It was like waist high, a little, well, yeah, about waist high. Weird place to have a neon sign inside a, <laughs> inside a window, just leaned up inside the window. Not hanging up, not up high or anything. And uh, so I got this picture of it and I could see, you could see the, the glass tubes um, the way I exposed it, you could see the glass and the reflection of the glass and the tubes and the neon lit inside of it. And it has this, um, uh, has this very kind of quintessentially eighties feel about it. And the, the, you know, 80% of the frame is black is complete black. And, um, and just that neon and the glow of it, it's just, and in black and white and just I couldn't imagine a better picture oh. uh, of that that kind of design of it I kind of it became an abstract design because I was cropped in or I, I moved in close I had a shot with a 50 I'm sure moved in close so that it was, became an abstract pattern and you couldn't make out the characters of the bent into the neon so um, you know, that's that landmark and I have it upstairs in our photo rail um our little exhibition space that we have in our living room. Um, I love that picture, oh, but cool. but there's a lot of um, there's a lot of um, how do I put it? Yeah, a lot of this darkness in the yeah. frame that I'm yeah. comfortable with. Let me ask you this, uh, and it probably we just need to wrap up soon. But I want to ask you. We may have talked about this once before, but. Do you think you can get inspired by yourself from your older images? Like, you know, we always talk about deep diving other photographers and getting inspired by this person and that person. But like, but have you thought about, like, when you're talking about this kind of picture or I, I, I'm thinking like, wow, imagine looking at your own work and saying, like, especially if you have had work from a very long time ago. So maybe for some of us older people or I guess younger people too, depends yeah. how much you've shot. But to go back through your own work and and gain an inspiration and ideas and stuff from your old like old stuff that you might have sort of forgotten or never thought about or just sort of evolved away from, do you think you think that's possible? Do you think could you do that or have you done that? I haven't done that. Um, I'm just trying to think. What my, I might find fulfilling is somebody tells me Antonio tells me, okay, here's a project for you. Go back through your old work look for inspiration, see what you can find. I don't think it would be something I would do on my own because I'm always trying to put, I'm always trying to get stuff down, um, get the picture out that was what my intent was, okay. move on, move on, move on, move on. Um, I mean, I'll be creating a lot of the same type of work because I don't really know I'm in it, right? So... Right, so right. Would it be up for somebody else to decide whether or not my my work actually evolves? I, I think it does. Uh, it may not. Maybe the way I do static subjects, especially, what can I do? I'm standing. I'm taking a picture of a building. How many options are there for me to do in terms of capturing the subject matter? Now I might process them differently. That's where right, the right, growth right. really is. Right. But I think if you if somebody said or you know, I decided go back, look through your old work, look for inspiration and go do it. That's the way I would probably approach it. I wouldn't, it wouldn't occur to me to go, um, yeah, it just wouldn't occur to me to go through that old stuff and see what I could find. Yeah. It's uh, interesting to think about that because, you know, if I talk about doing my, one of my winter projects or just for days that I'm sitting around and I don't have anything to do, it's, I, I, you know, my options are I need to clean this room <laughs> I yeah. really practically need to get rid of some of these slides. I mean, I don't yeah. need them. But to actually go through them, remember them, think about them, uh, see if there's something inspirational in them, um, and and apply that to something that I'm doing now or want to do now. Yeah. That might be an interesting thing to for me to, um, to dive into. Mm -hmm. uh, and especially because, I mean, for both of us, we've been shooting, you know, for a very, very long time. I've got a box of... Uh, negatives that I know of that's on the shelf up there that I know has my first role in it and a lot of stuff from high school and stuff like mm -hmm. that. I'm not sure what I can get inspired by by high school. <laughs> but, uh, you know, and, and some of my first pictures are of my cats. <laughs> so, 
Uh, what goes not, around comes around. Yeah, I know, I know. That's always <laughs> the case. But I'm, like, I'm just like, but it'd be interesting to go through that. It's a very small box, so it's not as much as, as, as slides and stuff. But anyway, it might be worth doing and looking at and, and maybe circling back at some point uh, after a few months and, and see if either one of, one of us have gotten uh, something from our old stuff, other than just looking at them and reminiscing and, and being nostalgic and stuff like that. If there's some thing that we could do to pull out from it and, uh, and start something new or try something new. It'd be interesting to see. Yeah, I think so too. So, all right. So we got our projects for the next <laughs> couple of months. <laughs> I, I, I like doing it actually. I, you know, I, for me now, it's more interesting that I found a way to scan them that are, that's fast. Right. You mm-hmm. know, when I had my scanner before, like I had no inspiration to like, Oh, well I could, I could scan these and put them up. And I'm like, who wants to do that? I want to sit in front of a scanner and then spot out all the dust. Like, hey, who cares? I don't want to do that. But yeah. now that it's that I've got the system and it's just like plop, 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 and I can shoot them. And all of a sudden I can show people what I've done in the past. I don't know. It might be, might be something uh, I'll, I'll do more often. So we'll see. Cool. All right. So that's it for today. That's we, it. Yeah, that's, that's it. That's it for me too. I that's it for me too. Good. In fact, when we're done, I think I'll actually pull out a box <laughs> Start looking at it. I'll show you my negative file here. It's just over here. Yeah. All right. Uh, tell people where you can be found these days. You can find me on Vero. I'm uh, W Rosin Photo. That is also my handle on Twitter. I'm also on Instagram at Ward Rosin Fine Art. Um, my little uh, website is called Rosin.ca. R O S I N dot C A. And you can also find me on Facebook at Ward Rosin Photography. And I have a little company called I call Ornus Photo, which I sell Seven uh, R Designs lenses and different brands of uh, lens adapters for Fuji X and Sony E mount. Also, our unofficial oh yes, sponsor. our unofficial sm- <laughs> unofficial, unofficial <laughs> sponsor. People are getting kids. When are they going to become official? <laughs> Whatever that means. One of these days. I'm just <laughs> not ready to run the fry machine just yet. All yeah. right. And uh, I'm found at uh, Twitter at Am Rosario and Vero at Am Rosario. And I'm no longer Instagramming, uh, but uh, we've heard about that already. Uh, Facebook, for those of us of a certain age, <laughs> you can go Rosario Photo on Facebook. And, you know, I might, I might be firing up my Flickr account again. I don't know. Um, so that would be also AM Rosario on Flickr or Antonio Rosario. So, I don't know. It's Flickr hasn't gone away yet entirely. So, anyway. Yeah, that's it. And, uh, well, we'll, we'll, we'll be back in a couple of weeks, I think. We'll see you then. In a couple of weeks, you think? Yeah. A couple of December. weeks. A couple of weeks. All right. Fortnightly, as it yeah. says on the site. <laughs> Fort- oh, yeah. Oh, okay. All right. Have a good night, everybody. You too. Good night. Bye. Bye Bye-bye.